All right, we should be live. <laughs> it says we're live, so uh, hello everyone. I'm the Dapper Dinosaur, of course, your host, but with me today, not for the first time, but for the first time on his own, just to talk about his own thing, is Dr. Dan Stern Cardinal. Dr. Dan, why don't you give us an intro? Tell us who you are, where you teach, what you study. Sure, so I'm Dr. Dan Stern Cardinal. I, uh, I have a PhD in molecular genetics and microbiology, and my thesis was on viral evolution. So I looked at some very specific aspects of how one very weird little group of viruses evolves. And it has to do with cytosine and why cytosine is dumb. And um, at probably not for this discussion, but if anyone's ever curious, ask me about cytosine sometime because I love cytosine and it makes like, as a molecule, it makes no sense. Different thing. Um, so now I teach general biology at Rutgers University. So I do the intro bio uh, thing. Uh, so I got between 600 and 980 students a semester. And then every summer I teach evolutionary biology, uh, which I'm in the middle of an evolutionary biology class right now. We're uh, done with two out of the four weeks of that class. So um, basically what I do is I, I my students are mostly on the younger side. Uh, you Most of them are first or second year college students. And um, we're talking about everything from cell bio and biochem up through genetics and evolution and ecology, all the way through like biodiversity and anatomy and physiology. And so we just cover everything. Um, but in my heart of hearts, I'm still an evolutionary virologist. And that's really like my absolute favorite thing. Um, so that's what I really love to talk about, which is what we'll talk about today, which is really exciting. Awesome. And we, we did have a quick question from just a walking fish who says, like the nucleotide cytosine? And I believe that's yeah. a yes. Yeah. yeah, like the nucleotide cytosine in your genome, it makes no sense. It's so dumb. And it's it's the fact that everything uses cytosine and has to deal with the same problems with it is beautiful evidence of universal common ancestry. Because it like if life evolved multiple times independently, then at least one of the variants would have found a better solution than what we all deal with because cytosine is unstable and it causes problems and the workarounds are just as bonkers. It's a Rube Goldberg of biochemistry. It's just terrible, but we all deal with it because we all have universal common ancestry. Awesome. Well, I think the first thing we should get into is just the most basic part of virology. What the heck is a virus? That is a great question. And actually relevant to this is a question I see in the chat over here. Viruses don't make sense. They aren't alive. That is, uh -oh. that's, that's, see, that gets we, right we, at it. That's, that's it. beach price. Yep. We might, we might, don't, <laughs> so we'll, don't we'll hold your horses on that. <laughs> we'll get to it. Don't worry. So, okay. So let's start with what a virus is. So a virus is a, the, the simplest form, it's three words. It is a subcellular. So it's smaller than cells or at least smaller than the cells they infect. Mm -hmm. intracellular, so it operates inside of a host cell, parasite. It uses the materials and some of the biochemical machinery and different viruses use different degrees of it, but it uses the raw materials and the enzymes and things of the host cell to replicate the virus, right? So it's a subcellular intracellular parasite that has an extracellular transmission stage. So viruses move from one cell to another with okay. a stage that is outside of cells. And if it does those things, that makes it a virus. All right. So basically. No, that actually makes me think. So there I can think of some subcellular uh but not uh parasites that do not go between cells typically, like things that, that are genetic parasites, like uh various things like maybe ALUs or something, where they basically just sit there and replicate themselves in a genome. Right. But the reason that they're not a virus or anything like that is because they never really leave that cell. They just kind of sit there and say, you know, hey, copy, make a copy. Exactly. So the the and I, if you want to be a little more specific, we could say a a extracellular transmission uh, within a protein coat of some kind. Um, All right. But that distinguishes them from things like plasmids or uh, integrating elements or transposons and ALUs are part of transposons where these are genetic elements that are basically parasitic, but they lack that extracellular transmission stage. So they okay. have other means of getting from cell to cell. So like 
uh, plasmids that infect bacteria, they can transmit via structures called uh, pili or uh, mating bridges. They're little tunnels that connect two cells and a plasmid that's inside one of them can then basically cause that cell to connect to a cell that doesn't have the plasmid and then it makes a copy of itself and goes down the tunnel and infects the other cell. Um, so that's a different kind of transmission mechanism okay. than what a virus uses. All right, and now viruses, there's also, if I remember correctly, uh, viroids, which do not have a protein shell, but are just bits of genetic material that can infect other cells. Yeah. And so the distinction there is that you need the protein shell to be a virus. Exactly. So the protein shell is basically if, if the, all viruses have two basic components, you have a genome of some nucleic acid. It can be DNA or RNA. It can be single stranded or double stranded. And that goes for DNA or RNA. So like our DNA, it's all, you know, the double helix, but mm -hmm. like the viruses I worked on in grad school, those were single stranded DNA viruses. There are also uh, single stranded or double stranded RNA viruses. There's viruses that have uh, actually a little bit of both. Um, they can have a circular genome. They can have a linear genome. They can have segmented genome. Like influenza has eight RNA segments that make up its genome. So you have to have some kind of nucleic acid genome. And then you have to have some kind of protein structure that surrounds and protects it when it transmits from cell to cell. Okay. So it, it seems like to some extent, this is sort of the, the simplest self replicator we have. Cause it's, it's a bit of protein and a bit of, uh, genome and it just kind of flies off and does its thing. Yeah, it's it's funny because there's such a continuum in terms of like, and this gets into the is it living question, there's such a continuum in terms of like biochemical sophistication among viruses. So some of them only have like these teensy little genomes, you're talking like 5,000 bases, like tiny, um, and they basically have two genes. And other viruses have thousands of genes and they basically do everything for themselves, except they have to be inside a host cell to do it. So right. it's, there are, there are other replicators. So there's like viroids and like plasmids. There are a lot of plasmids that are bigger and have more like biochemical activity associated with them than lots of viruses. And I totally think of plasmids in just kind of the same class of like parasitic replicators. Um, but I'm kind of weird in that regard. A lot of people don't think of them that way, but I, I kind of lump all that stuff together. <laughs> all right, well, we, we have some questions. So um, I'm gonna go through and see what we can get about uh, some of them. So one of them is just from The Great Stump, which is just how y'all doing? And I'm doing all right. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's a little earlier than I normally go live, but I, I, I think that works because um, my European fans never get good times for streams. So this is- And that's, that's my fault everybody so thank you for bearing with me this is exactly during my toddler's nap time is why we're All doing right. this time so thank you so we do have a quick uh, one question from miguel francesco Ogar, who says how do viruses evolve but i think that that's a big enough topic that i want to go through a few perhaps easier questions first and then we'll get into the how does a virus evolve because that's a yeah. that's a big topic as far as i can tell it's a big topic yeah um <laughs> so let's see um what does Dr. Dan think about the people who claim viruses don't exist or that they're antibodies our bodies produce to fight off GMOs, etc.? No. no. Viruses, so viruses have been around for all of recorded human history, and genetically we can we can draw them out, you know, further back than that. Um, but to give you an example, some of the like earliest depictions of humans, like we're talking um pre-Bronze Age collapse, like Egyptian depictions of like people um have pe show people that have measles and measles is caused by a virus um so like they're they're not a response to like modern you know modern uh environmental stressors or something that are that are that our uh, cells are are shedding or anything like that okay oh and we have a, a five dollar super chat from michael apple thank you very much who says no specific questions just thanks again for the great content well thank you michael i i really appreciate your your generous support of the channel it is very much appreciated and that that support is what lets me uh try to keep doing this uh we also have a two dollar uh super chat from corporal anon who uh we both know oh Corp, you asked about the giant Mimi viruses. I love those things. In fact, that's a really good lead-in, actually, because can we do the the are they alive thing? Because I wanna I wanna get some audience participation in here, and um, I think I think we can we can uh, we'll see what people think of this alive or not alive question 
in like a couple minutes. I'll do just a teensy little thing that I do in class to kind of get my students thinking about this question. Um, we also have uh, for 50 Danish kroners from Danish debater, is there a way for a virus to replicate sans host cell? Uh, if I think it means if so, how does this affect mutations, et cetera? I won't be here to hear the answer. Have a nice chat. Well, thank you very much, Danish uh, debater. I really appreciate the support. Well, but, don't, uh, don't go anywhere. I can answer real quick right now, uh, a little bit anyway. <laughs> He might already um, be gone, but okay. Oh, okay. Well, if you're still here, um, they don't. none of them can replicate without the host cell, but there are a small number of viruses that can actually grow uh, on their own. So they, they are kind of secreted uh, in an immature form, and then they, they morphologically mature outside of the host cell. Um, but they're not like replicating their genome or anything when they do that, so it shouldn't have any effect on mutations. Okay. All right, so... Um... Are viruses alive? Yeah, let's do let's let's pull the audience. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you just a couple of examples of things. And we could do a screen share here if that's okay. Absolutely. Um, let me pull up uh, some PowerPoint here. Uh, share screen. Um, as long as you don't bomb me with anything inappropriate. Yes. No. This is gonna be um, okay. We are going to pick this and we are going to share that. Okay. Oh. So what I want to do is full screen that. Okay, so you should be able to see full screen PowerPoint. Is that correct, or is it on Presenter Tools? I am still seeing it as uh, I think it's on Presenter Tools. Okay, but I can that, see it that, clearly. Well, in that case, we'll just we'll just do this. Uh, how about now? Uh, your screen share is gone. Oh well, that was anticlimactic, huh? All right, <laughs> let's. Uh, here we go. Okay, share I mean, screen. It was it was big enough on presenter tools. I, I like well, if that's... We'll, do, we'll do we'll do the full screen. We'll, we'll all right. The, we'll, we'll see what we can get. Go. Okay. So how about that? Now are we good? We're good. Okay. So, you should be seeing what I'm seeing, but yeah. Um. I well. I just have PowerPoint in my face now, so I don't see anything except oh, that. Okay. So if there's if there's um, anything. So I'm gonna I'm gonna be. Basically, here you go. Tell us, everybody, are these things living? This is, I saw someone said it already, bacteriophage, right? So these are like the spider or lunar lander kind of bacteriophages. Um, very famous in lots of experiments. Um, just basic virus that you probably have known about since high school. Are these yeah. living like, eh? so, so tell you what, guys, one in the chat, if viruses are alive. Two in the chat, if viruses well, are not specifically alive. Specifically this thing. Specifically oh, this thing? this thing is what we want to see. All right. So is yeah, this so. this particular object... Yeah. One if it's alive, alive, two if it's not, not alive. alive. Um, actually, I would say that until fairly recently, this was probably the image that most people had in their head for a back or for a virus. Um, right. <laughs> yeah. If if I it's asked true. someone to draw a virus, I think that they would do this little spider lunar lander style bacterial mm, page. That's probably right. Um, now, I think that might change. <laughs> now it's all and, the viruses all right. the time. Um, so well, that's I actually the thumbnail for this. <laughs> so I can't see the chat, but what's the um, what's the consensus looking like here? So we've got a two from Beach Price, a Ben from a one from Ben Swartz. Uh, we got a bunch of one point fives. Okay, good. All right, so let's go. All right, so eh, all right, so let's go to the next one. Let's go to actually before I do the next one, think back to like ninth grade bio class, right? When you went through all the characteristics of living things, right? They grow and develop, metabolism, evolve, respond to stimuli, all that stuff. And then your teacher was probably like, "Now viruses don't do those things, so they're not alive." So let's go uh, look at uh, a trickier one, I think. Um, these little cells right here, the ones with the red arrow, those are called nanoarchaea. So I'm not this, seeing that. You don't see anything with the red arrow there? No. No? I went to the next slide and it's got a red arrow. I still see your, your presentation with the slides listed on the left. What's there going on? There we go. Okay. I don't know. No, I didn't switch over to slideshow. Just, just don't bother using the slideshow. Oh, okay. You know what? Here's what we're going to do then. In that case, hang on. That's frustrating, but that's okay. We'll just do it the old-fashioned way. Here you go. Sorry, everybody. Oh, PowerPoint's being finicky. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to make this nice and big, and then we're just going to go through it like that. So we're going to try this again. Sorry, everybody. Okay. Thanks for bearing with me. You're going to have to screen share again. Yep. In okay. progress. Okay, let's do... Okay, there we go. So, and now I can see the chat too. Okay, so this thing over here, these little circles, those are called nanoarchaea or nanoarchaeota. This is, uh, so this is a domain archaea. So you've got uh, bacteria and then archaea and eukarya are the three uh, domains of cellular life. And um, so this one right here, this big one, that's free living. These nanoarchaea 
are obligate extracellular parasites. They have, they're some of the smallest cells that are known. They are obligate parasites. They're missing a bunch of like metabolic pathways. They cannot survive. They can't reproduce. They can't do anything on their own unless they are connected to the outside of this larger cell, their host, and actually make a little connection. They actually punch a little hole in it and they're constantly exchanging materials with it and basically just stealing stuff from it because they can't do the full range of things they need to do to survive and replicate on their own. So are those nanoarchaea alive or not alive? All right, well, let's go with one for alive and uh, two for not alive. Matt, and I, I actually would have to know a lot more about them to come up with a firm determination on that one. But it's, uh, I'd say it's iffy. We got a we got a two from P we Barnes. Two. All right. And uh, by the way, P Barnes, um, if you would like to be in the member slash um, patron Discord server, please let me know and get me a way to contact you so I can send you the join link for that. Because uh, as a channel member, you are allowed to have access to that server. So um, uh, just to put that out there. But we got some ones. So we got some one, people alive, 1.5. Um, <laughs> uh, just a walking fish. They have their own ribosomes, but they're missing some other stuff. Like, um, I think they're missing some, like, tRNA stuff. I don't think they make all the tr. I forget specifically. They're missing some translation-associated things, but they do make their own ribosomes. I like this. We, we've got a, a more alive than viruses. I'll give it a one point. Okay. 1. Okay. 9. Okay. So that one. Okay. So let's do, let's do one more. Okay. So this one, um, and uh, Colton, here you go. This is your Mimi virus right here. So this is uh, for uh, a brief window. This held the, held the, the trophy as the largest known virus, but it has since been eclipsed by like dozens of other viruses in the same general group. So this is a virus called the Mimi virus. It is enormous in terms of its size. It's almost a micrometer in diameter. Uh, its genome contains uh, over a thousand genes. I think it's about 1200. It has more genes than lots of bacteria, not just parasitic uh, prokaryotes like these, but actually like uh, free living bacteria. It's larger and has more genes in its genome. Um, it's spelled M I M I, but yeah, it's pronounced Mimi virus and it stands for mimicking microbe because when it was first discovered, it was misidentified as a bacterium for about 10 years um, because it was so big. And um, it wasn't until they couldn't culture it and someone decided to do an electron micrograph that they realized in cross section it was hexagonal, not spherical. Um, and that led to the realization that it was a virus. So um, these viruses, um, they infect amoeba typically, and they do everything for themselves except make ribosomes. Um, they take over the entire amoeba and build what is essentially a cell within a cell called the Mimi virus factory. And it's this big membrane enclosed compartment. And all it does is just churn out more Mimi viruses. So um, are those alive? And remember, they are larger and more biochemically complex than the nanoarchaea, um, but they're viruses, not cellular, um, and they don't make ribosomes. So are those, and again, these are now in terms of the range of sizes of these types of viruses, these Mimi viruses are actually on the low end. The biggest ones called Pandora viruses are about two to three times as big. And we actually isolated them from melting Siberian permafrost, which is definitely how the zombie apocalypse starts. Uh, yeah, I believe there's more than one TV show about zombie apocalypses that have that very plot. So yep. um, and, maybe and, don't and the, release the giant viruses from the Siberian permafrost guys. Yeah, the best the best part is after they isolated the viruses and and were like, oh, these are thawing out. They went, hmm, I wonder if these still work. And like the not the first thing, but like the fourth or fifth thing they did was expose them to a bunch of potential hosts to see if they still worked. And the answer was yes. Oh, good. That's that's wonderful. <laughs> they infect amoeba. Well, <laughs> hey, you know what? Some things affect, infect bats and pangolins, and then suddenly... And here we are. Yeah. Yeah. So, all so, right, so we, we still got some disagreement. We, we've got, we still have, we've got some who are going, yeah, I sure alive, and we've got two, some people who are in two. I think my, my thing is that whether something's alive or not is ultimately an arbitrary distinction that humans just kind of make up. So I, I can see good arguments on both sides. Now, I will, I will go one step further with these Mimi viruses. Okay. Because there is, I think, reasonably strong genetic evidence 
that phylogenetically, the group of viruses they're a part of constitutes a fourth domain with the three cellular domains. And they share common ancestry with the three cellular domains. Oh. Would that change anyone's answer? If this is not all viruses, but that one giant, that one group that contains the very large viruses, they're the NCLDVs, the nucleocytoplasmic large DNA viruses. It's, I think that this study was really good. And I think it's, uh, I think it's likely that they share common ancestry with cellular life. Um, and I don't know if that would change anyone's answer, but I, th I think cellular life and at least some viruses are monophyletic. So what I'm seeing here is that these, these gigantic viruses like the Mimi virus are actually more closely related to you than they are to bacteria. Uh, probably, yeah. And the cool thing about their genomes is they're super chimeric. So they actually contain genes that are found in cells but the genes in the cellular context are uh, restricted to one of the three domains. But you find cells like that from all three domains in the viral genomes. Okay. Well, it seems like the, the chat is basically like, I'm still not sure that it is quite mm -hmm. alive, but it's certainly, I mean, people, I think people are pushing more towards the alive side than they were earlier. Exactly. And the point of this exercise, and when I do this in class, so the point of this exercise is that, let me just stop that, there we go. So the point of this exercise is that you can't just draw a line using those criteria that you learned in ninth grade biology uh, between right. living and non-living. The point is that there is a continuum of biological activity. And the important things that we should consider are how are they related? How do they interact? And then kind of the question that's that links those is how do they evolve, right? So you can address those questions at different levels of biological activity, and that's going to work for cellular life, whether those cells are huge amoeba that do everything, or they are tiny little obligate parasites. And you can do those, you can make those same assessments for viruses, whether they're the enormous Mimi viruses and their relatives that do as much stuff as cells, with the one exception of translation. Uh, and then their and, and metabolism, they don't, you know, do, um, they don't have like electron transport chains or anything. Um, but with those exceptions, they do everything that cells do basically. And then all the way down at the other end of the viral spectrum, you have viruses that have two genes, one for the coat protein and another gene that when it gets into the host cell, it just says, copy me. And then the host cell does everything else. And like, there's no way to, to draw a consistent line where you include all the cells in your definition of living, but you exclude all of the viruses, unless you pick an arbitrary morphological feature like ribosomes or a what is technically a, a cellular plasma membrane. Um, some viruses have membranes, but they're not really the same. Um, so, um, like, yeah. yeah. So we have, uh, actually, there was a question that was before this one from LaserFan17, so I want to get that real quick. Yes. Um, and it was regarding um, the lipophilic nature of virus protein shells, because as we all know, the, the current pandemic, uh, one of the recommendations <laughs> is that because this protein shell is lipophilic and soap has lipophilic um, uh, molecules that are water soluble because they're, they have one lipophilic end and one hydrophilic end. So they can be used to break up um, lipophilic chemicals. Is that, a, is that a universal trait in, in virus protein shells? Great question. Uh, no, and it's actually not even the protein shell that's the relevant part in this case. The reason that soap is so effective against coronaviruses is that they're, they actually have an extra layer that a lot of viruses don't have. Oh. Uh, they have they have a lipid envelope. Uh, so they're actually nucleic acid uh, with a protein coat contained within a lipid envelope. And the soap destroys the lipid envelope because... Um, the soap and the lipids can interact with each other very effectively because they both have hydrophobic components. Um, influenza virus is the same way. That's also uh, a lipid, um, an enveloped virus. So that's why washing your hands is really good for uh, influenza. Um, what does the soap kills the virus? What does the lipid coat do for the virus that the protein shell doesn't? The lipid coat. Um, it, it helps interact with your body, both in terms of providing a really convenient place to put your um, proteins that are going to actually mediate the interaction. So it, you have your, your, your coat proteins, which are basically structural and protective. And then if those are also going to do the interacting, it becomes tricky to have a lot of flexibility in their structure. 
But if you have another structure outside that, and you have different proteins that are responsible for interacting with the host, then you have a little more flexibility because they're only doing one job. They're not, they're not having to also provide the structure that's gonna protect the genome. So that's okay. one benefit. The other benefit is that it allows you to pretend to be your host because when the viruses leave your cells, if you can picture this, right, the virus is inside the cell, you've got the membrane, and the way the virus acquires the envelope is it just blobs off a little bit of the membrane from your own cells. So in addition to the viral proteins being in that envelope, it also has like the glycoproteins, the, the proteins with the sugars, that are the ID tags for your own cells. So some of your cells see that virus floating around and they don't detect the viral proteins, but they check kind of your own your ID tags and the virus is like, yep, I belong here. And it can kind of go on its merry way. So it's a really devious strategy being enveloped because it allows you to steal some of your host identification proteins. Oh, okay. That I did not know. That is really cool. Yeah. I mean, it's horrifying, but it's also really cool. Yeah. Um, so we have from LaserFan17, could different viruses be a paraphytic group? And I think he probably means viral families. Um, it, so it's uh, not paraphyletic, it's polyphyletic. You have multiple independent origins of viruses. So there are viruses um, that I think, like the, like the NCLDVs that I just showed you, that are derived from cells or are at least share common ancestry with cells. There are other viruses that um, we know of at least two groups that evolved from plasmids that um, basically acquired uh, a capsid protein via horizontal gene transfer and then became their own new, completely new group of viruses. Uh, and then there's other groups that probably had their own independent origin. So the way we classify viruses is a giant mess because um, we probably all know like domain, kingdom, violent, class, order, family, genus, species. Viruses don't go all the way up there. You don't have viral kingdoms or, or viral phyla. You go up to um, families and orders, and there's nothing above order for viruses. And then above that, you have um, basically uh, types of viruses based on their genome architecture. So is it single-stranded DNA, double-stranded uh, DNA, single-stranded RNA, double-stranded RNA, um, retro-transcribing, and that's called the Baltimore system of classification. And um, it's generally understood that the different groups at the very least do not share common ancestry. So there are, I think, seven, I think there's seven groups in the Baltimore system. And um, there might be eight now with the weird retro transcribing ones, but there's, there's a bunch of groups in the Baltimore system. And it's generally understood that at the very least, there are that many independent origins of viruses. But we also know that there are multiple orders and families within each of those groups. So there are a handful of viral orders, and there's a bunch of families that don't fit in any of the orders. And those either families or orders probably each have their own independent origin uh, by either from a plasmid or from cells or just in the environment, some, some independent origin. Okay. What's? Well, it's super cool. Crazy. Yeah. And yeah. It, yeah. Now I do have I have my own theory on this, um, but it's there's no evidence for this. This is just how I think about like the origin question for viruses, and um, it kind of you have to go back you know billions of years to where you would have had um, just stuff in the environment just reacting. So in a pre-cellular world, you would have just had reactions happening all willy nilly. And there's there's a, a debate kind of uh, in the context of abiogenesis about like well cells first or metabolism first. And I'm very much in the, the metabolism first camp. And you would have just had like nucleic acids that were replicating in that kind of world. And yep. then different parts of that re those replicative cycles basically being enclosed in different ways. So some of them became cells, some of them became this kind of virus, some of them became that kind of virus is kind of how I think these different groups came together. So some of these viruses uh, like Gemini viruses, we know those came from plasmids more recently than lots of other groups of viruses. But I think many of the existing groups of viruses probably basically appeared around the same time as the first cells and kind of co-evolved from that ancestral mess of biochemistry. But again, okay. that's just kind of where I come down on it. And there's not like evidence for that in the strict sense. Yeah, you're you're saying this seems to make sense, but hey, we gotta wait for actual evidence before we really- Right. But based okay. on the relatedness and the patterns we see, I think that's the best. All right, which also I think answers uh, just a walking fish after this question from Beach Price that we have up. Uh, he also asked, uh, 
which view of viral origins does Dr. Dan subscribe to? I think you, yeah, I think you of, yeah, basically answer that question. So uh, from Beach Price, uh, at Deferdina, what virus does Dr. Dan think has been the most beneficial one to life kind? Most beneficial? Um, that's an interesting question because it's the, it treats viruses, and I think correctly so, as not inherently bad, even though we tend to think of them that way. But there's nothing, you know, inherently malicious about what viruses do. Um, it's just one more biological entity that interacts with everything else and often causes damage to the things it interacts with. Um, I'm not exactly sure what you mean by the by the term life kind, but I, I think all of biota basically. Like speaking for um, you know, speaking for mammals, uh, there's a uh, a group of proteins called syncytins that are. Uh, part of the placenta and actually are one of the major distinguishing features between marsupials and eutherians. So eutherians are what we think of as like placental mammals. Technically marsupials have a placenta, but it's much simpler and it doesn't last as long. And the reason for that big difference is uh, these genes and cytons that um, mammals, eutherians, uh, acquired via horizontal gene transfer from retroviruses. And it's basically an anti-immune system protein that suppresses inflammation. Um, and that basically allows the embryo to implant more robustly. Um, because what happens in marsupials is the embryo implants in the uterine wall. But then the uterus um, becomes inflamed because it mounts an immune response to that embryo. And that causes it to basically be evicted very quickly. And that's why marsupial offspring are born so underdeveloped. Uh, whereas eutherians are much more developed by birth. So that's um, that one's okay. useful for us at the very least. Okay. Um, and actually, so you mentioned retroviruses, and I, I think I think it would be in, good to have an explanation of what is a retrovirus and how does it differ from other viruses? Yeah. So retroviruses are one of the one of the Baltimore groups. Uh, retroviruses are viruses like HIV is probably the best known example that has an RNA genome, um, but then it it has an enzyme called reverse transcriptase. Now, regular transcription is during gene expression where you use a DNA template and you use an RNA polymerase to get your mRNA to express your genes. Reverse transcriptase is an enzyme that takes that viral RNA genome and converts it to DNA. And then from that DNA, it can do one of two things. You can either use the host gene expression machinery to make RNA and, and translate that into proteins, or you can use integrase enzymes to cut the host genome and insert the uh, genome of the retrovirus into the host DNA. And then, and then they just becomes, hang out. And then when that's activated, the, the cell will start producing more exactly. viral particles. And that's okay. why right now HIV is basically a manageable uh, chronic condition because we have drugs that are really good at preventing the gene expression side of that pathway. We can basically get viral load down to zero. And as long as you can afford the medication, which in some parts of the world, great, in other parts of the world, mm. but as long as you can get your hands on the medication, then HIV is a perfectly manageable condition. Um, okay. But it's not curable because it integrates into your DNA. And right now we don't have the means to remove the HIV genomes from the human DNA. And if you were to stop the antiviral medication, then those could reactivate and then you could see a spike in viral load, right? So that's, okay. that's how retroviruses work. They kind of have two different ways of replicating. Now, if I remember correctly, uh, reverse transcriptase or the gene for it is one of the ways that we can tell that a sequence in DNA is a, an ERB, an endogenous retrovirus, a retrovirus yep. that's basically just become part of our genome. Yep. And that's about 8% of the human genome. It's uh, ERVs, endogenous retroviruses, and they have like telltale kind of signs. So they have repeats on either end, um, tandem repeats. And then in the middle, you get, you get like genes that are retroviral genes. And what happens with an endogenous retrovirus is it infects the cells of the germline. Uh, so either in the testes or the ovaries, the cells that are gonna make egg or sperm. And then uh, something in that retroviral genome in the human DNA mutates, and now it, it gets stuck uh, and it can't get excised and reactivate. So it's no longer a retrovirus because it can't circulate 
extracellularly, it's restricted to being in the genome, so it's an endogenous retrovirus. And about 8% of the human genome are these defective viruses that have entered our DNA and then subsequently mutated and got stuck there. And the cool thing is we think of those mutations as like kind of random, but some of those mutations, at least, that inactivated them are actually like due to enzymes that we have that actually recognize retroviruses and go around mutating them to convert them into endogenous retroviruses so they can't pop out and hurt you, right. which much, is super cool. It's much easier to have a little extra bit of genome than it is to have a virus running around. Exactly. So you identify the sequence, that's the retrovirus, and you break it. Now the sequence is still there, but now it's inert, basically. It right. might transcribe, it might have some proteins associated with it, but it can't reactivate and become a virus that, that hurts you. So, okay. yeah. We have a question from Beach Price. Uh, would Dr. Dan explain what D-dimer is to me in easy terms? I don't even, I don't know what that is. I also don't know what that is. What is D-dimer? I can oh. look, look it up real fast and let's find out. Maybe it's something I know by another name. I don't know. D-dimer. Let's find out. Oh, and Beach uh, Price is happy with our uh, with your answer about the uh, the vir the ERV that resulted in um, the plus genes regarding the placenta. So gotcha, great. I'm glad that was a glad that was an appropriate answer. Uh, uh, D dimer. So this is um, looks like it has something to do with blood clotting and regulating uh, blood. Looks like it's an anti clotting factor, I guess. Um, and maybe I don't know. Maybe Sorry. Oh, I see. They're talking about D-dimer with the coronavirus because it causes blood clots. Um, sorry, I don't know any of like the pathology of what's going on with that. And like, I think it's going to be a year or two before we like really have a good idea of like what the pathology with the coronavirus is. Um, it's it's yeah. There's just so many like contradictory things. Like if you remember, like a month ago, there was the worry about the um, the Kawasaki-like syndrome in kids. And that was like a whole big thing for like a week, but now they did like a, a study on it and there were, there were a bunch of cases of it and like 95% of the kids didn't have the virus. So it's not that it's some other weird thing that was triggering it. Um, I don't think we're going to know for a while. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. All right. Well, Hey, I mean, there's, we, there's always stuff to learn. So that stay tuned to, to basically the various science outlets that will report on new papers is, and then check the paper. Don't just read the, the yes. science journalism, because science journalism is trash. Yes, I 100% agree. I'll give you one example of this that has made me so angry. You've probably all read the things on how, or at least seen the headlines on how um, antibodies don't last. There's no immunity. We can't get herd immunity to the coronavirus. Probably everyone's seen those headlines and they're, they're terrifying. Um, but like they're conflating two important things. There's antibodies when you, you, you make antibodies and then they go away. But then you have memory cells that when you're re-exposed to the pathogen, you can make more antibodies later on. You don't yeah. want the antibodies to stay around forever because when that happens, that tends to cause like autoimmune disorders. Right. Um, so that's really bad. Like the, they're supposed to go away after three or four weeks. The question is, can you make them subsequently? Right. Right. And with the vaccine trials that are ongoing, that's what they're testing. And they're seeing robust secondary responses so far. So yeah. they haven't obviously done the challenge. They're not, I don't know if they're going to do challenge tests against the virus itself, but the vaccine has shown that like, yes, you do get a secondary immune response to it, which is what you need. But these stories about how the antibodies go away is just like, it's just confusing two different things. And it's a, it's a, you know, with all the budget cutting going on with like, with like newspapers and things like there isn't a scientist on staff. There isn't a dedicated science reporter anymore. So there's, there's language that is used one way in the sciences and used another way in the normal population. And they ask, uh, well, are there persistent antibodies? And the doctors and scientists say, well, they go away after three or four weeks, it looks like, which is the normal answer for antibodies. That's what antibodies right. do. But then that's interpreted as, oh no, the immunity goes away. But that's yeah. a separate question. So I think, well, and correct me if I'm wrong about this, but you might be able to think about it in terms of things like, so when people are being tested for um, tuberculosis, right? They don't just draw a blood sample and check to see if there's anti-tuberculosis antibodies or anything, right? You're actually injected with something that will be recognized as tuberculosis. Yeah. And then if there is a reaction, it means that you either are or have been infected with tuberculosis because now your body remembers that particular pathogen and creates antibodies and an immune response to it. 
Exactly. You're doing an immunological challenge. Yeah, yeah. exactly. I am very familiar with uh, tuberculosis tests because I once lived with someone who had an active case of tuberculosis. And so um, when, when you tell the military that you've ever lived with someone with an active case of tuberculosis, they like to test you all the freaking time to the point that I actually a doctor had to step in and say, you cannot keep testing him for tuberculosis or he will start to convert the PPDs because he's been exposed to them so many times. Yeah. You have to stop Yeah, because then yeah, he will never be able to be tested. Yeah, eventually you're going to you're going to mount an immunological response to the test itself and that will break the test. Right. And yeah. so I actually had to have a doctor come in and tell the Navy, you need to stop testing him all the time. He will start testing positive because yeah, of too many tests. And they were like, OK, yeah, sure, we'll stop. I was like, thank you, because I was tired of like every time I went into medical, they were like, oh, it says you live with someone with an active case of tuberculosis. It was my grandmother, by the way. She works at a hospital which is basically the only way you get tuberculosis nowadays. Yep. But um, yeah, so I remember for, it was like for two years, she was on the tuberculosis medication. It was- Yeah, it takes a long time now, yep. It's, it was a nightmare. It's not good. No, so, um, all right, so we have from Ratchet Freak, couldn't sperm be classified as virus-like? I don't, I don't know. Uh, no, because sperm is just the, sperm's just the gametes for, for you know, male things. Um, they're not replicating themselves. They're contributing the genetic material for something else. And I mean, now, now that I've said that though, see, now you got me thinking because a lot of this has to do with just how you think of these things. So like, okay, let's take, let's take a sperm cell and let's pretend, let's like consider that as though it's a virus. So the thing it infects would be an egg cell. Mm -hmm. When it infects an egg cell, because now we're considering sperm as a virus, when it infects an egg cell, the thing that happens is it builds a complex multicellular structure, which approximately 50% of which generate more sperm. And the other 50% of which generate the host for those sperm. Yep. So, I mean, and it, I mean, it no, lies because most... it's cellular. The answer is no, because it's cellular. But right. if you want to look at it that way, you could look at it as a... Uh, as a, uh, a viral-like life cycle with an extremely complicated situation. <laughs> Actually, um, so in terms of the evolution of sexual reproduction uh, and the sort of like uh, with gametes, right? Because we have non-gamete-based sexual reproduction bacteria where they do things like, you know, they'll, they'll link mm -hmm. together and exchange uh, genome bits yep. and so... But in terms of the evolution of sexual reproduction involving gametes, there is actually one hypothesis that is the virus-like hypothesis, where it starts off with, um, instead of full cellular gametes, there being virus-like elements that are shed by um, some member, some organisms that and that's then how go they on. Do the, the mixing and matching? Yeah. So that's, that is actually a hypothesis out there. I don't know to what degree it's well supported. But I do know that it's out there. I encountered it when I was doing a, um, uh, it was my video, Let's Talk About Sex, where there was a creationist who was being extremely, extremely bad at knowing how sex works in the animal kingdom. Um, his, his best argument was um, if, if the male mutates and has a differently shaped or sized intermittent organ, it'll be completely incompatible with the reproductive tract of the female of the same organism. And I was just thinking, I don't know if he knows that humans themselves have a fair bit of variability in their intermittent organs, and that is not normally the, the, the case. Like, mechanical incompatibility is almost never the reason for infertility in human couples. So, right. it, but um, it can also, occasionally cause speciation. Uh, there's the famous case of the snails that have the, the either twist left or twist right, and it's a single allele that causes that. And, oh, okay. Yeah, so it's literally like a single base point mutation that causes the opposite twist, and then you become mechanically incompatible. So, yeah. um Because snails the, have to mate side to side. Yeah, right. So they have to they have to twist in the in the same direction, otherwise it doesn't work. Um, so there are cases where that can lead to speciation, uh, right. and that's been like directly observed. Uh, and there's there's the unfortunate case of of a love triangle among snails. If anyone wants to Google that one, it's it's a kind of a funny story. <laughs> Uh, we have for for two ninety nine dollar redos. I admire Dan's patience when he talks with YECs. I do too. You are extremely patient. I have seen you talk for hours with people who would make me want to pull my hair out um, if I had any. I appreciate that. I have I have as I said at the top. I have um, a lot of students, and the the stuff that I have gotten in class. It's it's I have the greatest time in the world in front of 
in front of you know 450 students and the questions you get are just all over the place and it's wonderful um and occasionally they do mess with you though um and then occasionally they ask you things not intending to mess with you but it's like seriously come on like the dude who with the long hair and the beard who um one time was asking me about how to grow plants in his dorm room and then later in the semester asked me about growing mu cultivating mushrooms and was like come on i know what you're asking me <laughs> like <laughs> oh you know all right we have from Dessel drace uh have you ever read or seen or read stephen king's the stand what is the likelihood of some country developing a kind of captain trips virus that spreads in nanoseconds and kills everything it touches now i want to take a guess and say that this is extremely unlikely to the point of basically being impossible, but I'm not the expert here, so I want to hear what you have to say. So I I have not read The Stand, but it is in my, like, read it soon stack. Um, but I will, so I can't comment specifically on that, but I will say that the thing that is going to be the zombie apocalypse, airborne rabies. And there's, okay. some, and there's some nightmare fuel for everybody. Because, Actually, because um, that's fast zombies. Rabies right. is fast zombies. Have you ever read the uh, the zombie survival guide? Um, no, I have not. So it's a lot of fun, and it it literally is just an in universe. There's been a zombie apocalypse. This is a survival guide. Yes. How do you Oops. not die from zombies? So I should. So funny, funny note actually. So um, you may have noticed the shirt that I always wear for these things is it's actually my paintball jersey, and my team is Zombie Defense Force Local Forty Two. Nice. So I, I like mean, it. I should. I should know. Uh, should I should get, you should get that. Actually, um, it's so the same author that wrote uh, the Zombie Survival Guide also wrote World War Z, a, an oral history yeah. of the zombie war. And um, so those those two things are linked. They basically are supposed to be existing gotcha. in the same kind of fictional you world. I need fun stuff to read. I'm going to read those next. I need a fun do thing it. to read. They're so. both excellent. Um, right, I'm going to do those but next. Thank you. The reason I say that is because uh, according to, I believe it's World War Z, the zombie virus is in fact a mutated rabies virus. I should say that the type of virus that rabies is, it, it doesn't work airborne. It doesn't transmit. Like there's a, it's a weird kind of virus and the shape is very odd. Uh, it, it looks almost like, like a mini ball that they, that they would use during like the American civil war, um, the bullet shaped kind of thing. And okay. um, it's a, it, it can't transmit airborne. It's, it's just not something that it could do. Um, well, to, but to be but, fair in, like, in zombie outbreaks, it's usually bites that are the transmission vector. Yeah. So, so, but yeah. I think one thing is, um, so with the transmission time in nanoseconds, I mean, viruses have to physically get to the cell, enter it, you know, insert their genetic material. The cell has to replicate the viral proteins and the viral genome. Yep. That stuff takes time. It does. And there's a word for that time. It's called the eclipse phase. And there's a lot of selection going on to regulate the length of that time, right? Because you want to make that as fast as possible in some ways, because like if you're a virus, you've got your one virus, but then you get into a cell and then the first thing you have to do is break down, right? You have to open up, you have to release your genome. So now you are zero viruses. So you've gone from one to zero. And then the eclipse phase is the duration from one to zero back to one, right? How long does that take? And you can do that really fast but that means you're probably going to replicate really fast and, and do a lot of damage to your host. And you could actually kill your host before you make all that many viruses. It might be a better strategy to slow it down and not make viruses that fast. Uh, and then okay. that, uh, at the end of the, the cycle, you'll end up actually making more viruses per unit time, even though you're doing it slower on the front end. And that the duration of that phase is part of it. And that limits the rate at which viruses can, can replicate. It's, it's, you actually lose infectivity before you make more of you. Okay. And I, I just want to point out uh, to the chat that um, chat is proceeding faster than we can get through questions. So we probably will miss some questions. So if you really, really want to get that question in, um, I, w I do always move super chats to the top of the line. So um, that is one thing. So I cannot guarantee that non super chatted questions will actually be answered because we are you guys are more active than we can respond in real time. So I really appreciate that though. So keep it up. I mean, keep asking questions. Uh, I just wanted to make sure that everyone knows that there, there's a fair chance that we may not get to every last question that's been asked. But I think the other thing uh, about this, this question that I think find interesting is kills everything it touches. 
because um, we've already off air, we've had discussions about things like uh, there's been creationists who like to use things like virulence as a measure of fitness and viruses, right. but that's stupid because why would you want to kill all of your hosts? You need your hosts. Right. And if you're super deadly, you're going to kill all your hosts. And then what happens to you? Now you're dead. At the very least, you need to kill your hosts at a slower rate than your hosts reproduce. Otherwise, you're going to go extinct. Yeah. So um, so maybe we can talk about the uh, intercellular versus or intrahost versus interhost uh, competition in viruses. Yeah, absolutely. It's, because uh, that's, that's also something that there's been in the news. Like, is the current virus losing virulence? Maybe, yeah, maybe not. Should we maybe. expect it to? Should we yeah. expect it to? I mean, maybe we should eventually, but eventually. is that now? You would think. So this is, this is one of, I think, the most interesting aspects of viral evolution. And it gets at the idea that what is good, what is beneficial, what is high fitness is constantly going to change. It's a moving target and it's based on whatever the ecological conditions are. So if you have a situation, you know, early in a pandemic, right, where everybody is susceptible to a virus, well, the limiting factor for you is not finding hosts to infect, right? There's lots of hosts uh, because everybody is susceptible. No one's ever been exposed to whatever new virus it is. You know, just a new virus, hypothetically, not like that, whatever cause a pandemic or anything. <clears throat> well, um, hey, you know what? I already told YouTube that there was going to be discussion about COVID-19 on this. And they were like, okay, yeah, I guess so. You so you can just say it. It's fine. So, <laughs> so, so, so you have a, you, you have a situation early in a pandemic where, you know, lots of people are susceptible. So now any old virus that's in a host and can replicate itself will not have a hard time finding a new host. But the tricky thing, because every potential host is, is relatively rapidly being exposed to that virus within the host, there's going to be a lot of competition, right, for the limiting uh, resource, which is host cells to infect, you know, lung cells or whatever tissue it is that the virus infects. So early in the pandemic, the selective <coughs> pressure that drives that viral phenotype is going to be effective competition inside the host. And that's going to lead to higher virulence, because if you're infecting cells faster, you're destroying host cells faster, you're damaging more tissue per unit time. So you initially expect to see higher virulence in a situation like that because the limiting resource is going to be cells within each host, but it's easy to get to other hosts. But now if you go as a pandemic progresses, um, and this can be just because of the virus spreads and some percentage of the population is infected and some of them might die, and then the ones that, have, that recover are now no longer susceptible to that particular virus. So now you have a smaller fraction of the population that's susceptible. So now you start to limit the possible hosts in the population that are susceptible to that virus. So now the limiting factor is getting to the next host. It doesn't matter how well you compete within one host. You could be 100%, your you, your viral strain could represent 100% of the viral load in an individual. But if you can't transmit to the next host, you're going to go extinct. Right. So now the selective pressure is going to maximize getting to the next host. And that means keeping your current host alive longer. And, and well enough to, to actually go infect people too, exactly. right? Because if you're bedridden, you're then, not going to infect many people. Exactly. So what you expect to see as the percentage of uh, susceptible individuals in the population decreases, then you should see a decrease in virulence because you're changing the, the, you're basically flipping the selective pressure from intra-host competition to inter-host competition. Effectively, the viruses in me are competing with the viruses in you to get to that other guy that's that's still susceptible, right? right. So and that I, leads to lower virulence, typically. I just, before I get to a couple of super chats, I just think it's great that, so we, we get, what's basically kind of a silly offhand question about a Stephen King book? <laughs> And yet it actually leads into more than one awesome like, discussion yeah. about virology. So that's one of the things I love is when like you get weird stuff that's just like, oh, hey, and we can go off into an actual cool discussion. Right. But I want to get to these well, uh, couple super chats. Well, there's oh, one more ahead. note I want to make on that on that question, because it's not just an ecological thing of who's been infected and what percentage of the population is susceptible. But the great thing about that dynamic is behaviors can also impose a selective pressure on the virus. So, for example, so wearing, masks. wearing a mask, 
that's going to <laughs> decrease the ability of that virus to transmit from host to host. In effect, it has the same thing as vaccinating a bunch of the population because they have the same effect of if you have one person that's infected, you're decreasing the frequency of exposure to other susceptible people. Yeah. Right. A vaccine does that one way. A mask has the same effect on net. It's just a different way of doing it. Yeah. The virus so, sees it the same way. I don't get exactly, to as many new hosts. Exactly. So what we can do with behaviors like distancing and mask wearing is impose a selective pressure to make the virus less virulent. So even if we're waiting a long time for a vaccine, which I really hope isn't the case, I really hope by the fall we have a vaccine and they can ramp up manufacturing. And it'd be nice. If that's not the case we should still be able to impose a selective pressure to decrease the virulence. And we see this, and, and, and you may be thinking, well, wow, that would be really fast for that to happen, just one you know, viral year. But we've seen this happen before, where the 1918 influenza pandemic was devastating in 1918, and then into the, the winter of 18 and 19. But then the following flu year, 1919 into 1920, that same strain was circulating, but it was no more dangerous than your average flu. And yeah. it's for that reason that the number of susceptible hosts had become low enough that you flip the selective pressure. So Which, like that's a thing that can happen. Although I want to point out, the flu is actually a serious disease. If, yes. Especially if you're someone who's susceptible. Yes. You need go go get the vaccine. Yes. Every, and even if you're not susceptible, get the vaccine because yes. you're pr protecting people who can't get it. I At one point where there were some flu years where the vaccine was in short supply, I did recommend to some people like maybe save it for, you know, the elderly or the otherwise infirm, but most years in the past, like what decade, it's been abundant. Just, it's been fine. Just get yeah. It. Yeah. So um, just, just go. Yep. Yeah. If there's a shortage, then yeah, maybe if you're mm -hmm. young and healthy, you might want to skip it and let other people have it who need it more than you. But yeah, that's not been the case for a long time. But uh, we have now have we're now up to three super chats. So I'm sorry. So let's yeah, um, let's go to the sorry. Okay. <laughs> so uh, Michael Apple for five dollars says book recommendation for the good doctor plus more money for Dapper Dino. Thank you. Uh, Theories of international relations and zombies by Daniel Dresner. That sounds interesting. I've never read that. I. Uh, I'm going to write I, that one down too. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, I think I will put it. that on my, uh, I'll, I'll at least put that on my wish list, I think, um, if you. I remember. Um, yes. And also for the almost $8 redos from Ian Chen, uh, but I thought the bird flu went from a pandemic to a whimper to an extinction extinction due to genetic entropy. <laughs> Tell Dan I love his videos and YouTube daps. Thank you very much, Ian. Very much appreciated. Yeah, for, anyone that's, for anyone that's not paying really close attention to like, creationist genetics that's a, a reference to a paper by dr rob carter and dr john sanford claiming that the 1918 pandemic strain genetic entropy itself to extinction not once but twice uh since 1918 um and it's wrong for every reason um and i have a video so shameless not even promotion. i have a video on that check it out um, yes actually dan's channel is linked in the description so please go subscribe to him he has excellent stuff at, yeah, Thank sorry, you. didn't mean to interrupt. I just wanted to make sure everyone knew that it was in the description. Awesome. So um, I heard, this is from Vandali1990 for $10. I heard there was a plan to use bacterial, I think it's bacteriophages, uh, to kill the bad bacteria in us instead of using anti, probably back, antibiotics all the time. Mm -hmm. Would that be more effective? And I've also heard about that. And yeah. I, I don't it's, know many of the details. Oh, oh, let me tell you about phage therapy. So yeah, this is a real thing. It's called phage therapy, and it's new. Um, but the reason we don't have it in the United States, and I wish I was joking about this, but the reason is Cold War politics. And so the, the the way phage therapy works is you have a bacterial infection, and you take a culture of it, like you know, like you get a throat swab for you know checking for like strep throat or something, and then you grow in in a lab, you grow up bacteriophage on that particular type of bacteria. So you, you basically adapt a bacteriophage to your particular infection, and then you somehow ingest or uh, introduce into your system the bacteriophage. And they will target specifically the bacteria that they've adapted to that are causing your illness. This is great for a number of reasons. One, doesn't kill the rest of the bacteria in your body. So like when you're on antibiotics, it kills like your gut microbiome, and then that has to grow back and that can cause issues. Um, two, uh, just like with antibiotics, um, the bacteria can evolve resistance to the bacteriophages. But the great thing is the bacteriophages also evolve. Yeah, they so, can evolve to overcome resistance. Exactly. So yeah. you're fighting fire with fire with that one. So that's really cool. 
Um, now, the reason we don't have this in the United States, but we will soon, I think there's a trial underway for at least one, one form of it. Um, the reason we don't have this is that penicillin was introduced clinically in 1942. Um, that's an American in invention. Um, Fleming, Fleming was American, was he? Or was he, I think he was American. And I don't remember, maybe I'm just being American centric. Um, but it was the Western allies in World War II right. shared penicillin with each other, but we didn't share it with the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union developed phage therapy. They were a little bit slow to get into the antibiotic game, but they uh, developed uh, phage therapy kind of in parallel um, where you're using viruses to kill the bacteria instead. And um, the two main, um, the two main uh, uh, labs where they have the, the, the basically the, the storage uh, for thousands upon thousands of phage strains that were developed in the 20th century um, are in Warsaw, in Poland, and Tbilisi, in Georgia. And um, if you have the means, you can go to Warsaw, in the, like in the United States, uh, if you got like a, a resistant you know, staph infection or something. Um, you know, in the United States, like say you cut your foot on something and it gets infected. In the United States, they'll just say amputate. You can go to Warsaw and get phage therapy for that and save your foot. Um, All right. So like, that works. Okay. Yeah. But we, we don't have it because Cold War politics. Like, what are you, some kind of commie? We have antibiotics over here. So <laughs> Antibiotics, that, that's, that's the freedom way to treat bacterial infections. Um, so we have for $5 from Josiah Hansen. Uh, can we get a vaccine that will make me able to drop Twitter conversations with COVID idiots? It's a real problem. I wish, but I don't think that that's a possibility. I've honestly just started unfollowing slash unfriending because I'm just like, I cannot have another mask discussion with an idiot who doesn't know how air works is basically what it comes down to. Like, you don't know how. Okay. Fleming was Scottish. Okay, Scottish. There you go. Scottish, everybody. And I will never forget that because now that I've said it wrong on the internet to a bunch of people, I will never get that wrong again. There we go. Okay. Um, do, 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 do. Oh, and uh, Dessel Dre says, uh, thank you for the response. For the record, there aren't any zombies in the stand. Um, I do know that there, there weren't zombies in the stand. I just... Oh, okay, got it. It, it just kind of came up as another virus-related kind of fiction. So um, it seems like the three, the three big virus tropes in fiction are... It just kills everyone immediately for some reason. Um, zombies. But then also every once in a while you get vampires coming in from a virus. So um, there have been, there's actually been at least two TV shows that I can think of. Um, one was The Strain, which was uh, written and produced by um, Guillermo del Toro. And in that one, there is a there's a parasitic worm that also hosts a symbiotic virus that infects humans. And so the worm requires various elements of human blood to survive. And the virus then causes changes in the morphology of the host's human to help them acquire that blood. And so there was that thing. And then there's also one that was on Netflix recently. Um, I think it was V Wars. It wasn't terribly good, but it was literally someone gets exposed to a revived permafrost virus and it turns them into a vampire. And it's like, okay, well, sure. Um, mm -hmm. I'm scrolling back up because I had to scroll down to get the uh, the super chats, but I just want to make sure that I'm not missing too much. Um, okay. So let's see. Um, while you're looking, I'll just tell everyone something cool that um, one of my students actually gave me this link in class just the other day that um, there is a group of plasmids in Archaea that like right now in the lab, we're watching them um, acquire the ability to transmit through lipid envelopes extracellularly. So uh, we're getting to watch a new group of viruses evolve from plasmids in the lab right now. And that's super cool. And this is um, from 2017 on Virology Blog. Yeah, but Dan, they're still just vi uh, plasmids. I mean, yeah, macroevolution isn't real. Except that they're they're not going to be plasmids for much no, longer. They're, they're going to literally be viruses. Yeah. Gonna, um, yeah. So this is from Don Giovanni. Is your reading list last in, first out, or first in, first out? My reading list is a mess because um, it's sometimes it's first in, first out. Like if a new book comes out, I'll, you know, read it, done. Um, but then also there are books I've been reading for a long time, and I tend to be reading like more than a couple books at a time. And it's just, what do I feel like getting into? And I'll usually, you know, kind of 
dive in and out of books on and off for like maybe a week or two or more. And then I'll kind of decide I want to finish it. And then I'll like actually just read that for a few days and finish it. Um, but my, my book max, uh, my book list is a giant mess is, is the organizational scheme. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Uh, this is from uh, Dessel Drace. Uh, and his question, this is kind of a follow up. Uh, <clears throat> sorry. What is the technological feasibility of developing a highly virulent strain that quickly kills most of the targeted population uh, the kind of bio warfare prohibited by the UN. As far as I know, it's possible, but it sounds like a pretty it's, big challenge. It's terrifyingly easy. Is it? It's oh, okay. super easy. And there was actually a big debate over this a few years back. If you search, um, if you just Google like ferret flu, um, there was a big debate over this a few years back because there are strains of influenza that transmit very easily through humans, like the normal um, seasonal flu really easy to pass that from person to person, but relatively not that dangerous. It still like kills like tens of thousands of people every year in the US, get your flu shots, everybody. Um, but in terms of like, given the number of people involved, the, the mortality rate is relatively low. There are other strains of, of influenza viruses that typically um, we're talking about like avian flus. If they infect people, they don't spread very readily at all. It's hard to transmit from person to person, but they have extremely high case fatality rates. You're talking 20, 30, 40%, like really bad. And um, just a few years ago, um, some researchers found that if you co-infect ferrets with the easily transmissible human influenza and the highly virulent bird uh, avian influenza, you can get a hybrid strain that is both highly virulent and easily transmissible. And this was a whole big controversy because they published this paper and like there's a method section and it's like, well, we did X, Y, and Z and we got this virus. And there was a whole big thing about like, do we, do we, should we be doing this kind of thing? Like and that can, method section is like the how to make a bioweapon 101? It basically worked out to like how to make a deadly strain of flu using ferrets. And the thing, the thing where I came down Sounds on this like a was, literal comic book plot. <laughs> it's no, it's, it was like a real thing. And um, it's the, the, where I came down on it was, yes, you should do the work. Yes, you should publish it because it's so easy. Like either somebody could figure out in secret how to do it and not tell anybody. And then we would never know it was coming. Or we could do the work, publicize it, make it well known so that everyone can know what to look for in the event that it ever happens either in nature or maliciously. And I would, I would bet that that kind of thing would happen in nature because these viruses are constantly flying around and reassorting with each other. So, I mean, it's the kind of work that I think needs to be done so that we're prepared when that kind of thing appears for one reason or another. Yeah. Um, so <clears throat> from Vandali 1998 for $5, uh, do we know if any viruses cause extinctions of species in our earth? I don't know of any. Yeah. I, I don't know of any specific cases. Um, and kind of going back to what we mentioned a little while back, that would be a really bad strategy for the virus. You don't want yeah. to call it, make your host go extinct. We did try this. We did tr attempt a little bit of biological warfare against rabbits in Australia in the 1960s, I want to say, because um, they're highly invasive um, because eutherians are not native to Australia. And then um, the rabbits yeah. got there and they did what rabbits do. They bred like rabbits. Over. Exactly. Yeah. And um, so we were saying, well, we could use this virus. It, it, I forget the name of the virus, but it basically think like rabbit Ebola. And in the first year, it killed over 99% of the rabbits that uh, were exposed to it. But then the fatality rate dropped to like very low subsequently. Um, because then once the population, basically all the susceptible individuals died, then the only ones that made it th through the bottleneck are the... Um, the ones that had, you know, some kind of resistance or or were more robust uh, against it, and then all the offspring and rabbit population, it you know, it bounced right back, and then all the offspring were basically resistant to it, and so there are still rabbits. Yeah, uh, Dan, can I get you to turn so your uh, webcam off and on? There's a weird sort of desync because you've roboted a couple times, and I think there's a little bit of a audio sync thing. So maybe turning the the camera off and on might help with that. Um, one thing I, I want to point out is that that idea about like you can't you can't have a reproductive strategy that results in your extinction and bother to exist for very long. Yep. Um, that actually happens in some some fiction where basically it's like, does anyone know anything about biology? My, my two favorite examples, uh, one is actually from Star Trek Voyager, where there's a species that lives for seven years and each female only ever reproduces one time and has one infant as a result of this reproductive event. 
So every seven years, your population is going down by half. That At sounds best. like a not, yeah, because if it's sexually reproducing, the rate of replacement is two per female. Yeah, that's just if there's no unusual death, like no one dies without reproducing, and you have sexual reproduction, which they did, you still need at least two just to maintain, and you yep. cannot actually maintain because accidents happen. People yep. will die before reproducing. Uh, so that was just absurd. And there were like some novels or something that tried to be like, oh no, twins are common. It's like, are they? We never, that was never discussed anywhere. Um, so that was one. And then actually in a, a show that I just mentioned, which was The Strain, where these, this kind of symbiotic um, parasitic worm virus combination, whenever, whenever one of these infected humans would then try to feed, it would automatically spread the infection. But the infection also caused that person to become ineligible as a target for feeding because it did something or other to their blood, whatever. Mm -hmm. But that basically means that you literally cannot feed without producing a new member of this subpopulation, which means in the long term, you're just going to run out of humans because yeah. also most of these resulting humans were incapable of doing much more other than just randomly feeding because they were hungry. They didn't re retain a whole lot of intelligence in the most for the most part, hmm. there were some exceptions. So they were really a lot like zombies and that they just go run around trying to and feed. But yeah, it was, I was like, that doesn't really work in the long run. You can't maintain a population like this unless you're like, yeah. what, what's your, so yeah, there's, what I'm saying is if any of you are writing a, like a science fiction story or something, <laughs> double check the biology because people get it badly wrong pretty often. So please see if like just do a quick sanity check run the numbers like can i sustain a population of this fictional organism i'm thinking of mm -hmm. um and i get some of that um in my so i have a speculative evolution project going that you may I, you may be familiar with that right dan yep so um i get a lot of submissions for um very extensive use of asexual reproduction and a lot of times i'm like that is not going to be a long-term viable strategy like I, and I've actually had one person who I, I, in, I said, I, I'm not going to just have this organism just reproduce asexually. I'll leave that as an option that it does, but I'm going to have it have a sexual strategy. And it was like, well, why? And it's like, because without sexual reproduction, you run into a lot of problems where you get become extremely susceptible to pathogens or um, even just environmental change because you do not get the genetic variation that you want. There's a reason that, um, like asexually producing, like parthenogenic species in animals, they happen, right? There are currently parthenogenic okay. crayfish running riot all over Europe. Right. Although They're going to go. If you're parthenogenic, though, you still have males. You, you're still sexual. You just don't well, have this, to. This, this population <laughs> actually does, in fact, lack males. Oh, really? It's, nice. It's a wild population. And it, it actually spawned from one mutated crayfish being released from someone's fish tank. Oh, no. Yes. He. he it, Yep. And what do you know? Now there are crayfish populations just destroying waterways all over Europe. And there actually aren't any males. But the thing is, that, that won't last. That species yeah, probably, will yeah. go extinct. I can almost guarantee it. Yeah. It will. Now, it's going to be on the span of, you know, thousands of years and not tens of years. But it, it's not going to stay around. Something will come in and it will devastate that population. And it just won't recover. Um. So yeah, that is one of the things is uh, people forget how important that ability to, to mix genetic information really is. Like it's it's vital to the long term survival of most most macroscopic species. Yep. Um, we also have uh, for from TD Lane for two dollars. What is Dan's favorite extinct organism? Uh, so, you know, if I had to pick just one, I mean, the answer is Luca, the last universal common ancestor. Like, uh, but is it extinct? I want to know what that thing. Oh, that's definitely extinct because Luca was four billion years ago. Ah, oh, but like we were talking, we, we've had this discussion. Is no, it does it count as an extinction if there's still a continuing if the lineage, lineage exists? Right. <laughs> yeah, like is so, Latin extinct or is it just now a bunch of other languages? There is there is nothing there is nothing that exists right now that if we were to have if Luca was to spontaneously appear in front of us. There is right. nothing that exists right now that we could look at Luca and go, that is an X, right? It would be something completely unlike anything that's alive right now. So I think we can say, even though the lineage persists, then 
the I species no longer that does. specific thing is extinct yeah uh, and that's fair yeah um but it is actually an interesting question of what counts as extinction does simply evolving to the point that you're no longer recognizably the same thing does that count as extinction it's it's one of the fun questions in phylogenetics of are the are the internodes on the tree different species from the the terminal branches i i mean it gets into the problem with with the species thing right because species yeah. are a box that humans toss biological entities into and yep. it's useful because you need to have a way to talk about groups of organisms right but on the other hand Species aren't real in a fundamental way. They're made up. Yeah, it's made up categories. And the lines we draw are arbitrary and made up. Yeah, like what's the difference so, between a species and a subspecies? And what about uh, different species in the same genus that can produce fertile offspring and even do in some cases in the wild? Mm -hmm. Yep. And it's like, like basically all baboons can interbreed, but we put them in a bunch of species. And there's even a species of baboons that's mostly hybrids. So, yeah, I mean, I'll give you an example from viruses just how out of whack this whole concept is, is that um, in some uh, groups of viruses, so in order to be the same species, you need to have, you know, X percentage genome identity, 90, 92, 95%. You have some kind of reference genome. And if you're 95% identical to that or 90% or whatever, you're the same species. And that's going to be a member of a genus and there are going to be other species in there. But then you could have the sister genus to that. And in order to be a member of that genus, that sister genus, maybe the threshold is 85 or 86%. So like, or maybe the species on one side is 85 or 86%, but then the genus on the other side is like 92%. And yeah. it's just totally arbitrary lines. Then like, why? Why is, why not 91.5%? Like it's, it's arbitrary. It's point, it's just silly. So yeah, my, I, Darwin in Origin of Species, he has a line about basically he says, um, I'm not going to go into the question of a species here. Uh, every naturalist knows vaguely what he means when he says the word species. And which is like, you know, that's like, you got, you got a lot of nerve considering the word species is in the title of your book and you're not going to define it. Um, but well, like, on the other hand, he's got a point. <laughs> yeah, it's well. And uh, one of the things that um, Sometimes you get asked, uh, especially by creationists, because they like to point out that species is a is a really fuzzy word, which, by the way, is it not is. true of clade. Clades right. can be exactly defined and right. objectively verified. Yep. So, so really what they should say is, oh, we don't, you have, the really the thing that they should compare, because they like to bring this up when they talk about kinds, because, you know, we'll say, what's a kind? And they never have a good answer. I was like, well, you don't have a good answer for what's a species. It's like, okay, but yeah. I do have an yep. excellent answer for what a clade is, and I can objectively demonstrate that they exist. Yeah. Now let's, let's get back to your crazy word, because yep. I'll grant you species is kind of a stupid thing. It's just there for convenience. Clade yeah, okay. is not. That is, so, that is absolutely the best answer of of you don't have you don't have a good species definition. Correct. Species definitions are a giant mess and it's much better to talk about lineages and monophyly than it is to talk about species because that right. we can we can like that is not uh subjective, it's not, right? Yeah, that's it's not that's concrete. We, there are cases where we don't know what clades are there and what they look like in terms of their ancestry. Like there are cases where we just don't know what's going on but they can be exactly defined. A clade is an organism and all of its descendants. That's a clade. No ifs, ands, or buts. And actually, by some definitions, you can actually exactly define a clade, and you might not know which all the members are, but like, mm -hmm. for instance, um, a common uh, definition for dinosauria is the most recent common ancestor of Passer and uh, Triceratops. Another one is uh, Megalosaurus and Iguanodon. And both of those recover the same animals. But there's, you know, the, there's some questions like, oh, uh, like recently there's been a question, is, would sauropods actually count in that? Because there's been a new hypothesis about dinosaurs that says that <laughs> sauropods are actually basal to theropods and ornithischians rather than being grouped with oh, theropods. And so if that, turns out to be, if that turns out to be true, then by the traditional definitions for dinosauria as a clade, sauropods actually wouldn't be dinosaurs. And so then there are questions of if we, if this That's hypothesis really turns out to be true, which is certain, it's still very iffy on that particular hypothesis. But if it turns out to be true, do we redefine dinosaurs to keep sauropods in? Or do we just say that sauropods aren't dinosaurs? I'm in favor of saying, well, they're not dinosaurs then. 
we've already defined the clade. We don't get to just make stuff up. Oh, see, I think, see, I think you could just redefine the clade because that's all arbitrary anyway. Like, I mean, it, like the clade itself is totally objective once you define it, but the right. definitions are whatever we want them to be. And you could just pick your node, pick your most recent common ancestor and say, okay, that's the new thing for the clade. Like that's. Whatever. But I, I tend to I tend to like the the rule in taxonomy that once you publish it, unless your unless your paper is invalid for some reason, like maybe it's like a um, a nomen nudum, which basically means you you've published a name but you didn't publish enough of a description to actually describe a, a real taxon, mm -hmm. so it just doesn't count. Unless there's some technical problem with the publication like that, once you publish the name, that's the definition for that name. It's in the literature now. Ah, that is change that. Uh, I mean, you can, but it is a long-standing rule in taxonomy that yeah, you but publish I, it. I have, and that's what it is. I have a lot of problems with a lot of the long-standing rules in a lot of biology, and that's one of them. I think Fair I think um, we should be much more flexible in how we define our groups. Um, and part of this is that we're trying to we're we're taking this cladistics approach of of nested hierarchies of monophyletic groups, and we're trying to shoehorn it into the Linnaean system, which only has the levels from kingdom down to species. So then you've got all these like supergroups and subfamilies and superphyla and subclasses and like all these intermediate things. And like having the rank titles like that is just like, why are we doing this? It doesn't matter. Oh, yeah, the, the ranks I don't think are very important. Although one thing I would like to point out is that um Actually, there there is currently a rule um, that says that if a name for an organism hasn't been used, and I think it's about fifty years or something, and another name has consistently been used for the same taxon, it gets to be the new name for it. Nice. But do you know why that exists? That exists. Uh, I have no idea. So for decades, everyone called Tyrannosaurus rex Tyrannosaurus rex. Right. But everyone just kind of forgot that the first paper describing this organism named it Dynamosaurus Imperiosus. And no one wanted to go back to that name when that was not. discovered. So yeah. they introduced a new rule That's into right. taxonomy to get rid of that, that name. They were just like, no, we're gonna stick with Tyrannosaurus. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it should be, in the same way that language, I think, should be descriptive rather than, pro, like language rules should be descriptive rather than proscriptive, I think we need to have that flexibility with cladistics and say like, what is the way that people typically define a group then we could identify a most recent common ancestor. We could look at a phylogeny and identify a node as the most recent common ancestor and yeah. like use that. Yeah. All right. So we have a question from Beach Price. Uh, what does Dr. Dan think is the most dangerous for virus spillover to humans, animal farms or expanding into wild animal territories? Oh man, I'm going to give you a third answer. And the, the third answer is climate change because what we're seeing with climate change is, um, basically more interacting among things that didn't interact before. So you get a little bit of everything. You get spillover, especially where you're you're clearing, um, like for example, tropical rainforest for um, uh, like grazing land. So you're getting spillover with natural populations and livestock, um, but you're also having the expansion of the range of where viruses live um, because the vectors for those viruses, uh, for like for like mosquito vectored things, uh, now can exist at higher latitudes relative to what they used to. And like uh, an example of this is dengue is marching north. Um, and the mosquitoes that carry dengue are going a little bit ahead of the virus. So like, for example, the mosquitoes that carry dengue are now endemic to Southern Florida. For decades, they've been marching up through the Caribbean. And now they're for the last few years, maybe a decade, I don't not that too much long. Um, but the mosquitoes are now endemic to Southern Florida. Dengue virus is not, um, but within a decade, probably Miami will be a dengue zone. Um, and when that happens, you know, you're in a brave new world now. And yeah. it's also going to be true for like the Gulf Coast, for Southern Texas, like that, that's, you know, the big problems are where there are viruses that can, uh, that exist in nature that typically don't interact with humans. So even if they're able to spill over occasionally, it's at very low levels and it's very, rare occurrence where due to climate change and there's a you know obviously there's a complicated cause and effect of this right because climate change is expanding or changing where arable land is but it's also caused by deforestation to get more grazing and more farmland um, right. so it kind of goes both ways um, but what you're doing is you're increasing the interactions between host and viral populations greatly increasing the likelihood of spillover yeah okay 
Um, um, oh, that's what I was going to say. Sorry. I, I had a thought. It was basically, I very rarely advocate for the extinction of any organism, but mosquitoes, no, I honestly, if, if humans find a good way to make mosquitoes extinct, let's just go for it. 100%. Yeah. I mean, people like, oh, but they, uh, they pollinate plants because that no, they, they actually, don't. well, don't. screw them. They, they do pollinate plants though. That is a thing. They, they are pollinate. Yeah. So mosquitoes they don't actually pollinate. eat. They, they don't, they various flowers. I don't, I don't, don't remember off the top of my head, which ones, but, um, so mosquitoes don't actually eat blood, right? Female mosquitoes use blood to get hormones from mammals that they use to help stimulate their own reproductive cycle. Oh, it's only a handful. Okay. It's a handful of orchids. There are a lot of orchids. They'll be fine. Yeah. Whatever. Well, and the other thing is, I don't know that mosquitoes are the obligate pollinators of any plants. Okay. So, that's good. So yeah, just get rid of them as, as far as I'm concerned. Oh, I yeah, do well. not. Yeah, like people are like, oh, the biodiversity. I'm like, at a certain point, also, they're just so destructive to not just humans, but just so many other organisms. I think biodiversity on the whole would be better off without mosquitoes. Um, there, granted, there would probably be a few knock on effects, but like, it'd be, honestly, it'd be fine. And the knock on effects, you have to weigh it against like literally millions of human lives every year. Exactly. Like yeah. mosquitoes are like the single largest cause of human death. Like yeah. when you get like, rid of the mosquitoes. If, if you're going to say that, oh, the, the biodiversity, I want you to go go to sub-Saharan Africa, find some people dying of malaria or dengue fever or something like that, and tell them why it is that it's important that we keep mosquitoes around while they're dying of malaria. Just Just have fun with that. And if you can convince them, then you can convince me. But good luck with that. Kill all the mosquitoes. Kill all the mosquitoes. Uh, this is from Desil Uh Question, what are some interesting examples of viruses with very strange or unique symptoms slash side hmm. effects? Hmm, that's an interesting one. Um, so the ones that I that I think of, because um, parent of a young child, and when your child goes to daycare, you get all the viruses. Um, oh, I'm aware. You get all the viruses. And... Uh, so you get some really weird ones that little kids get and they have like very distinct odd symptoms. So like there'll be, um, uh, there's one, um, uh, parvovirus. It's actually in my, my little single stranded DNA virus. It's, it's the only pathogenic, uh, in humans, single stranded DNA virus. It causes, um, slapped cheek rash or, uh, Fitz disease. And it's, it's just, it's bright red rashes on the cheeks is huh. the main symptom. And like, why the cheeks? It's just, that's just what that virus does. Um, there's other viruses that, um, will, will cause irritations, rashes, swelling, um, in like very specific parts of the body, which is weird. Um, there's other viruses that will cause sores in your mouth. Not like the herpes viruses, the cold sores on your lips, but like, like canker sores almost like in your mouth. Mm -hmm. Um, and like, why does it do that? It's just weird that that's the thing that it does. Um, yeah, it's there. There's some really weird viruses out there. Um, Trying to think of any non-human examples, and I can't think of a good one because but so far aren't... none that reanimate the dead, right? Uh, no zombie. Yeah, so the zombie pathogens that we know of are fungi or um, parasitic worms that will actually get into the nervous system and mess with behavior. Um, although rabies is pretty close, but um, yeah, other than that, it's it's all zombie brain, you know, fungus like uh, cordyceps, and then parasitic worms that yeah. make snails. Actually, I would say, uh, yeah. Rabies is itself pretty unusual. I mean, the extremely the, the increase in aggression, the decrease in cognitive function, the the avoidance of water. It's basically a zombie virus. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's a very strange thing. Um, if you're ever bitten by an animal, please get checked for rabies, and if you have it, get the treatment. You do not get, want. No, it's it's the number of people that we know that have survived rabies without getting the uh, treatment. Um, digits, isn't it? It's like four. And, like they do not, cases. and they do not fully recover. They have significant brain damage afterwards. If if you develop symptomatic rabies, you are almost certainly you going to die. die. And if you do not die, you yes. will not come out okay. You will be yes. severely really impaired. Bad. Yeah. Um, so we got Steve McRae asks, uh, so cladistics, especially monophyletic clades, are specifically defined by ancestry. I think it means descent, right? Yes. Um, so every clade includes in its definition um, a single common ancestor for the clade and then all of its descendants. Now, there's two basic ways to define a clade. One is you, you do sort of the, the crown group definition where you say the most recent common ancestor of these two taxa, 
and all of their descendants. So um, you can say something like, uh, so like I said for Dinosauria, right? If you say the common ancestor of Passer, which is the pigeon, and Triceratops, and all of its descendants, uh, at least if we don't accept the newer hypothesis about dinosaur right. ancestry, then that includes all the sauropods, all the ceratopsians, like all the iguanodontidae, you know, the, the velociraptors, every bird you've ever heard of. Uh, gets covered in that. The other main way to define a clade is to say everything closer to this than it is to that. So um, there's a clade, I'm going to bring it back to dinosauria and relatives because, I mean, that's that's what I do. Um, so there's a, a one of the definitions for Ornithodira, which is a wider group than dinosauria, includes pterosaurs, is um, every animal closer to, and then you pick a dinosaur, and a, a common one is just Tyrannosaurus because everyone knows it, so everything closer to Tyrannosaurus, but you could also just say Passer, right? The pigeon, which is a common bird that people use for cladistics definitions. So everything closer to Passer than it is to uh, Crocodilus, which is the, the genus of the, the Nile crocodile, right? That so defines Ornithodira, but it doesn't say the common ancestor of these two things. It just says anything closer to mm -hmm. a pigeon is on the Ornithodiran side. Any, anything closer to a crocodile is in the other group, which is now called Pseudosuchia as a result of complicated shenanigans with rearranging cladograms, basically. And there is a there is a third approach to that, which is go by derived traits and say the yeah. first thing with this specific derived trait and everything descended from it. Yeah. Th that can be tricky, though, because sometimes you can be fooled by convergent evolution. When you that have happens. to deal with convergence. You have to deal with with horizontal gene transfer. It's recombination. It's yeah, yeah. you have to be very careful. That's one of the reasons those are the, you always whenever you do phylogenetics, you have to you you like you remove recombinant stuff from consideration specifically to avoid that issue um yeah. a dapper just quick note um just private chat programming note in there just so you know all right oh yeah that's that's fine um all right and so for five dollars from vandali 1990 we have why are some vaccines one and done like measles and polo i think it means polio i've never heard of the polo vaccine <laughs> <laughs> uh but others need updates like the flu uh and why do we give them to babies yeah. So, um, and this is great because I saw another question about vaccines in there too. And and vaccines are like the greatest invention ever. So we should definitely talk about oh, vaccines. Oh, I, I so agree. The the reason is that there are different types of vaccines, and they elicit different um, strengths of response. So, um, measles vaccine, uh, smallpox vaccine, and for a long time the polio vaccine, although not the one they use now, uh, they're called live attenuated vaccines which means that the vaccine actually contains a replication competent virus. It's a virus that can replicate, but it is adapted to some other organism, usually like chimpanzee cells. And then it is uh, not good at infecting humans. So it, the infection is subclinical. You don't get sick from it. Um, but because that virus is replicating in your system, you generate a very, ro you basically get exposure to a large amount of it. So you get a very robust immune response to it. There are other viruses, uh, other vaccines that are um, called uh, inactivated vaccines, where it's the whole pathogen, but the pathogen is dead, so it doesn't replicate. And then there are subunit vaccines, which are just the part of the vaccine that your or, or the uh, pathogen that you, your immune system recognizes. Those typically give you a lower uh, exposure to the pathogen because they are um, it's just a lower dose. Um, because they're not replicating, and therefore you don't get as large an immune response. So you typically do multiple uh, rounds of that, so boosters, um, to, to, to generate the full strength immunity. Now, things like influenza are tricky because the reason we do influenza every year is because the virus changes every year. So your influenza vaccine from last year won't work for next year because the strain of influenza that's gonna be most common is not gonna be the one that was most common last year. Uh, so that's why we do it uh, for things like the flu like that. And then for babies, it's because a lot of these viruses are mostly going to affect very young people because everyone else in the population has either had the virus at some point or has been vaccinated. So once you're above five or 10 years old, either you've gotten it already or you've been vaccinated, so you're good. But very young children could still get it. And it's often very young children where the uh, symptoms could be most severe and most dangerous. So we vaccinate people very young basically to give them protection during childhood when they're most susceptible to this stuff. And it's things like that that have um, 
driven a lot of the increase in life expectancy over the last hundred years. There have been gains at the high end of the spectrum, but most of the gains are moving that average because the zero to five or zero to 10 life expectancy is so much more than it was 200 years ago. So you have much more likelihood of making it to 10 years old. And a lot of this has to do with the early childhood vaccinations. Yeah, that's actually uh, something I've discussed. Um, I don't know if I've discussed it on air, but a lot of times we get these things like, oh, um, you know, lifespan in the, the 1200s was like 30. It's like, right. But that's because lifespan takes into account all this infant mortality. If you made exactly. it to be 18 or so, you were probably going to get into your 60s in the 1200s. It's just that not a lot of people made it to actually become adults. Yeah. But once you did, you 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 cleared most of the hurdles that were going to kill you early in life. And so you yeah. were probably good. Um, so that's one of the things because you read in history. And I, I was confused about this at first, too, because, you know, I'd always heard these lifespan estimates. But then I'm, you know, studying history. I'm getting all these people who are, you know, 70s and 80s way back in like, you know, AD 400. I'm like, well, what's what's the deal? Why are we getting so many old people? And then I had to look into the statistics. Like, what do these stats actually mean? Because it doesn't mean people were dying off at 30. Almost no one was dying at 30. Right. That you're relatively safe there, but you, right. you, it was the, it was the, did you make it to five? Did you make it to 10? That was the hurdle. Right. Um, yeah. And by the way, there's another, I saw another question scoot by in the chat that I wanted to address because it was vaccine related. And it was about like, what, like anti-vaxxers saying, well, if they're safe, why don't adults get the same dose as babies relative to their body weight? It's because it's about eliciting an immune response and the dosage as an adult, you have a more robust immune system. So a smaller dose gets you the robust immune response you need. Are you saying Come that, on, that we, this is that medical science actually has things like nuance and concern for actual things like, you know, not wasting precious vaccine doses and whatnot? Who'd have thunk? Crazy. Uh, also, this isn't a question, but TD Lane says the crocodilian cladogram is shifty. It is extremely shifty. If you ever want to get into a nightmare about what clades various organisms belong to, look into Pseudosuchian and... Um, Clitistics and why the word crurotarsalian no longer refers to the group it used to. And I'll give you a hint. It's because of phytosaurs. That is why. Um, so, yes. Oh, and we have from Steve McRae. Polo is the virus that causes yuppies to wear IZOD pullovers. <laughs> Definitely get vaccinated against that. Yes, we need a vaccine for that stat. Um, I, there was a question that went by, I think... I feel like I'm missing it. Um, oh, no, I think it's just that the, my chat window in um, StreamYards isn't updating as fast as my uh, my chat window over on YouTube, the studio for YouTube is. So I'll just ask it from here. Uh, so Steve McRae has a question. What is the main reason a virus crosses species boundaries and finds new vectors in humans for cross-species transmission? High, mutation rates, see, high muti the mutation rates seem insufficient ex as an explanation. Yeah, it's so it's a combination of having high mutation rates, which means you're generating a lot of variation. So within a viral population, you're going to have lots and lots of variation because they mutate fast. And uh, there's a lot of them, right? And there's a lot, and the population sizes are astronomical, right? So you have lots of variation. That means that some small fraction of that population might be able to infect a different host if it was exposed to it. That alone is not going to do it. Because those viruses, even if they have the ability to infect a new host, are not going to be as good at infecting the new host, right? You're going to replicate slower because right. your enzymes are adapted to your typical host. So if even if you have like the surface receptors to get into something new, you're probably not going to do a good job infecting that thing. So it's not a good strategy. Anything that makes the jump probably won't be very high fitness. But what can happen is you have uh, this thing in evolutionary biology called the competition dispersal trade-off. And this is where you have basically in any population, viruses or not, you're competing with other members of that population for whatever resources it is that you as a species utilize. And even if you win the competition for the resources, that still carries a cost with it because there was energy you spent competing that you could have spent finding resources, reproducing, caring for your offspring, whatever, right? Energy is a limited resource when it comes to your evolutionary strategy. So competition, even if you win, is still costly. Right. So if you have the ability to utilize another resource, 
and there's less competition for that resource, it may on net be better to use that resource even if you are not optimized for it. And that's where you get viral spillover, where you have a very highly infected population over here, and some members of that viral population can infect this alternate host. Even if they're not good at infecting that alternate host, if there's a high enough density of virus on one side, then the competition costs are so high that, you know what, like, even if I'm really slow replicating over here, there's no competition, so that's a better strategy. It's called a competition dispersal trade-off. So in cases of viral, persistent viral spillovers, what you're seeing is that the dispersal side of the ledger becomes the on net better strategy. Uh, okay. And in order to do that, you need to have the ability to make the jump, and that's where the high mutation rates come into play. But you also need the ecological situation to be such that it's beneficial to do that. And actually, one, one thing I, I want to go on a little bit with is, um, so we've heard a lot about bats being a source for the our current woes. And um, there's actually, bats are weird, right? Because they have extremely high metabolisms. And so effectively, a bat always is running a fever from the standpoint <laughs> of like its biochemistry. Effectively, a bats are just permanently having fevers. And one of the things that that does is actually make, the reason you get a fever really is to some extent, your body is trying to make it more difficult for the virus to replicate by raising yeah. the temperature, which yeah, decreases the efficiency. Yeah. yeah. So that's one of the things where like, bring down fevers if they're too high, if they're dangerously high. But if you've got like, you know, if your fever is at like, you know, 99.5 or something, just leave it. 100%. Don't, just leave it. You will yep. be better off with the low, low fever. But um, what that means though, is that bats almost always have multiple viral infections in their bodies that are not mm -hmm. causing any noticeable symptoms to the bat, which makes them just gigantic storms for virus evolution. I mean, that's us too, though. We're constantly dealing with viruses. We have we have tons of viruses all the time that aren't making us sick. Yeah. It's, I mean, there's, there's one estimate that 10% of what our immune system does is just deal with cytomegaloviruses. Huh. Like, yeah. We're just, we're just infected with tons of viruses, but they don't make us sick. Yeah. But related, related to that, um, it's not just a fever that if the, if it's not dangerous, don't treat it because it actually helps you get better faster. Um, a lot of disease symptoms are like that. Um, iron withholding, um, even something like diarrhea is there, there've been studies where people have volunteered to get, um, I forget what specific type of diarrhea. And basically then, um, they divided them up and said, okay, you're going, we're going to treat the diarrhea versus not. And the ones that didn't treat the symptoms recovered faster, even though you can imagine it was less pleasant. But um, do drink water. But do drink water, yeah. Yeah, but don't do anything to prevent the diarrhea. And that actually led to a faster recovery. So there's lots of things like that. Fever, diarrhea, iron withholding, coughing, yeah. sneezing, mucus in your respiratory tract. Like those things are is what our immune system is doing to help defeat the infection. So to the extent that having them is not dangerous, let them be because you will recover faster. And yeah. I should note, I'm not a medical doctor. I'm not dispensing medical advice. I'm talking from an evolutionary perspective and summarizing the literature on that question. Just yes, want to make nothing that said, clear for everybody. Nothing said on this channel should constitute medical advice. Always consult your own physician if you yes. have questions regarding the treatment of a disease. I want to make that perfectly clear. Thank you. But uh, yes, but it is also the case that, that, yeah, there are a lot of symptoms that aren't the virus directly causing something it's your body causing something to help it fight yeah. the virus even the soreness of like influenza that's saying we want to put our energy towards our immune response so like don't get out of bed today like that's why you feel terrible it's your body doing that yeah like the flu virus isn't actually making your joints hurt it doesn't infect your joints that's your immune response saying you know what you're gonna not move today right we're just gonna be, be nice and sleepy and just yeah um, and man, I, I hate that joints, that joint soreness, soreness. That is my least favorite uh, disease symptom that I've ever had. Um, other than the almost dying of pneumonia that one time, that was also worse. That's but uh, That's yeah, Don't yeah, um, it was actually a, um, it was actually a bacterial infection. It wasn't a virus, but there was a little bit of a scare because another guy that I worked closely with also got pneumonia around the same time. It turns out it wasn't from the same cause, but there was a, there was a period where the both of us were admitted to the medical ward on the aircraft carrier and we were like next to each other and they were like, don't you two work together? And we're like, yeah, sometimes we're in the same department. You know, we stand watch together and whatnot. And um, they were like, what? That might be a, a big problem. Oh, and uh, you have condolences from Steve McGray because he wasn't 
subscribed. Oh, yeah. And, and, oh, and also because you had to have a conversation with Jungle Jargon. Oh, I got a, I got a chat scheduled with him for Monday. And, um, you know, I, I'm really looking forward to that. I want to see where he's coming from because um, I, I just I don't know. So I want to see where he's coming from. Um, I think yeah. we're going to take um, probably one more question and then we're going to do some wrap up stuff. Um, cool. So maybe if a super chat comes in, I'll, we might tack that on, but we'll have to do it quickly. And, and this last, it's okay. There's one after this question. There's one last thing I want to show everyone. Just kind of contextualize how oh, yeah, I think of viruses and how they relate to other things because it's, I, I think it's just an interesting way of thinking of things. Um, so Unidentified Leviathan asks, if we had the money, could we build a virus to target cancer cells? Uh, and then he also asks me, how did I get pneumonia? So, you want to answer the pneumonia question first? Uh, yeah, so I it was a bacterial infection. I don't know the exact source. Um, I got it while the ship was underway between uh, Bremerton and San Diego is when I developed symptoms. Um, my symptoms came to a head where I actually collapsed and um, lost vision and muscle control. And I had to be physically carried to get an IV. And we had just, we were just pulling out that day from San Diego. And so at first I had to, the first thing I had to do was convince the medical staff that I wasn't just drunk. Because they were pretty insistent that I was just drunk. Mm -hmm. And so I actually had to get in a character witness who said, no, I know, I, I watched him sleep for the entire, like not physically, but like I know that he did not go out and get drunk. He was in bed pretty much the entire day because this guy had been on duty and he'd been, you know, in and out of the birthing area. So you can tell if someone's in there because, you know, the curtains are closed and sometimes they're snoring or whatever. So yeah, he was like, no, this, this guy is definitely not drunk. And I was like, thank you. And then they finally get an IV in me. And I took in, I believe it was five of the large uh, IV saline bags before I had to use the bathroom. So oh, that's not good. No, I was nearly dead. Um, that's really it, bad. It was extremely bad. Uh, so the problem was basically I, I would sleep all the time because I had no energy to do anything else. But I was also sweating. I had night sweats, but I wasn't awake long enough to replace the water. Oof. Yeah. Yeah, that's bad. So, um, and uh, if we had the money, could we build a virus to target cancer cells? We are trying to do that right now. Um, my understanding is the challenging thing is because a hallmark of cancer is genetic instability. You lose like all the DNA repair uh, mechanisms. And that's part of what makes it work. It's just trying lots of different mutations because just it mutates faster than normal cells because you, you've broken the DNA repair mechanisms. This means that the cell surface receptors are distinctive from the rest of the cells in your body. But it also means that they're a moving target and they're different for every instance of cancer. So it's hard to generate like one anti-cancer virus or even like an anti-lung cancer virus or an anti-this or anti It's hard to do that because every cancer is genetically distinct from every other instance of cancer. So we are trying to do that. And there is some like there like some of the trials look promising. The problem is the specificity of being able to make it like more universal, universally applicable rather than like generating this one big expensive, you know, thing. And then it only works with this one specific kind of cancer. So yeah. it's, it's challenging, but yes, it is absolutely possible. Um, we also have a, from, for $5 from Ilya Moon, uh, just sending support. Thank you very much, Ilya. I really appreciate it. Um, Ilya is, she's a, is, she's a constant supporter. She's very, very big friend of the channel. Um, Thank you. Uh, actually on a somewhat, Related note, um, I have a friend of mine who he, he's a, he wears a lot of hats. So he he owns a family farm. He is also an Eastern Orthodox deacon and he runs a cancer research lab in Africa. So it's it's got a lot of that things that he does. Interesting. Yes. So but um, his his research is primarily regarding um, making uh, white blood cells that have been genetically engineered to specifically target your personal cancer that you have. Mm -hmm. So they get they actually get samples of your cancer and use that to train these um, cells. Mm -hmm. But one of the interesting things is they also actually turn those, I believe they're using T cells, but they actually turn those technically cancerous because they program them to stop with the, uh, the to basically not stop reproducing. They just constantly reproduce, but they also do it so that that activity is only there in the uh, presence of a particular drug that they can just choose. And so they choose some innocuous thing like, yep. you know, aspirin it's an or something. Off switch, yeah. And so basically yep. while you have these injected and you're taking that drug, you have two kinds of cancer that are fighting each other. Mm -hmm. And then once the, once the hopefully more 
controllable cancer wins, then you stop taking the drug, and that is what gets rid of your second cancer. It's so cool. So um, that's yeah. that's the research that he's working on there. Um, they've been having apparently very promising results. Uh, so, you know, cancer is one of those things because every every cancer, even if it's the same kind of cancer, right? You have small cell carcinoma. Someone else has small cell carcinoma. There's still not the same cancer. I promise right. you. Yep, one hundred percent. So that's one of the things that makes cancer tricky because, like with a virus, sure they mutate. But, you know, if if you have HIV and some other person has HIV, they're not going to be completely different diseases, right? Like the same kinds of treatments are likely to work. Um, and we have the here we go. And this will, I think, be the last thing we, we do is this this right here. And then we're going to sign off because, uh, well, Dan has places to, to go, people to see things to do. And a toddler downstairs. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, so I want to just I want to just finish with this figure because this is um, a completely different way of thinking about what viruses are and how they relate to other things. So there are so up here we got viruses, right? And viruses, rep plus just means they're they replicate in cells. CP is capsid protein, so they have a coat that, that they're going to transmit inside. And then int is integrase. They can like retroviruses can integrate. Other viruses can, some viruses can't. They got these different elements. They definitely have rep and CP. Maybe they integrate. Plasmids, they definitely replicate. Maybe they integrate. Uh, integrating elements down here, these are like your transposons. So these are going to have rep and integrase, but they don't have a capsid all the time. Some of them do, and it's weird. And the distinction between them and viruses when these have a capsid is tricky. Um, but the reason I'm showing you this kind of goes back to what we what we started with, with which is our viruses alive, right? And it's not just that I think viruses are alive uh, because they have you know bio, biological activity, and if you were to plot them along with cells, they overlap. Um, but I think you have to consider all of these different entities along that same continuum: things like plasmids, things like transposons, things like viroids, even things like prions. They all share the same basic set of biological activity, or at least some subset of it, and they all exist on the same continuum. So um, for everyone that's here today thinking about like how viruses work and what they do, I don't want you to think of them as some like distinct entity that's over here that's completely separate from these other things. I want you to think about them as just part of the continuum of biological entities that are constantly not just interacting with each other and co-evolving, but also actually turning into each other and coming from each other. So we know that plasmids and integrate integrating elements have become viruses. We think viruses came from cells. We know that viruses contribute genes to cells. So there's just this giant mass of interaction here at the genetic level. And that makes it hard to distinguish like broad categories, right? To actually say, this is living, this is not, and things like that. So just want everyone to keep that in mind as you think about this stuff. There's, there's, it's, everything is basically the same. It's just what subset of things do you do and then how does that drive the interactions? And that's kind of where I wanted to awesome. make sure we got that. No, I really like that. And uh, you showed me that that picture, uh, I think yesterday or something. And I was, I was like, wow, that's actually really, really interesting. I never really thought about it that way. Um, it didn't introduce something I didn't really already know, but it just associated it in a new way. Yeah. Made me think about it in a, a different kind of light. But um, I think that's where we're gonna wrap it up here, guys. Uh, Dr. Dan has to get going. Um, so if you have further questions for him that did not get answered, check out his channel. His channel is linked in the description. Go over there, hit subscribe, hit that notification bell and ask questions. He's got comment sections. Just type it in. Um, I'm sure that Dan, you, you probably you, you check your comments. I assume I check my comments. Uh, there yes, absolutely. So yeah, you so. ask something. Um, and, and look, there aren't that many subscribers. So like, I'm going to see your comments cause there aren't that many of them. Uh, yeah, so um, uh, I'm going to go through a little bit of channel news. Dan, you don't have to stick around for that if you don't want to. It's right, just I am going to I am going to get going because I know for a fact that the toddler is up from the nap. So I'm going to go. All thank right. you, everybody, for for being here and for your fantastic questions. I hope you had as much fun as I did. Dapper, thank you so much for hosting. You're very welcome. Um, all right, so uh, last few things. Um, Tuesday is looking like Kent with Bent is on. Um, I have had to do a lot of work getting a couple or a few videos ready so that I can um, basically have a, 
couple weeks where I work on something that's not coming out this that particular week. And that is uh, why there has not been a lot of the speculative evolution stuff going on. But I now have a buffer of like six videos. So I can start working on that pretty hard now. Um, so Tuesday will be a with Bents. Um, this Thursday, it's possible it might be something else, but it will probably just be um, uh, Noah Zookeeper, the movie will come out. Uh, Saturday is likely actually going to be a debate with someone named Mr. Batman, who I was requested to debate by a creationist viewer. So uh, we are probably going to be talking about uh, macroevolution as it relates to birds specifically. Um, uh, and it's likely that Erica will be the moderator for that. Uh, so it'll probably be around um, noon 30 Pacific, uh, 1.30, or sorry, 3.30 uh, p.m. Uh, Eastern on uh, a week from today. So uh, yeah, come back here in a week plus a half hour and hopefully there will be a debate with a creationist. So, yeah, no, Steve, I know you say, no, dude, not Mr. Batman, but here's the thing, right? If you're gonna debate creationists, they're all terrible. So I'll talk to him. If he's rude, we can get rid of him. I'm sure, I don't doubt that he's morally bankrupt, but I mean, look, it's hard enough to get any of them to come talk. So I'm gonna look into it. And we're going to have a talk about that. If he goes into other weird places, I will have Erica shut that down because we're going to we're going to stick to the topic. And yes, I know he's seriously strange, but he wants to have a conversation, and it, other people wanted me to have the conversation. So we're going to have it, and we're going to see what happens. Hopefully, what happened with Faithful on is true doesn't happen again because I don't know what I'm going to do about that. But TD Lane. <sighs> Klingon hole danach edge verschov. Toch pit. Katlo hoch 